And we'll be reading Matthew chapter 25. So Matthew chapter 25, we'll read from verse 31 to verse 46. Thank you. And if you're able to stand, please stand as we honor God in the reading of His Word in Matthew 25, starting from verse 31, reading. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. And all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of these least, one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick and in prison, and did not minister to you. Then he will answer to them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, even as we continue to honor you in the reading of your word, May now your Holy Spirit speak to us and give us, Lord God, the truth and the lesson that you are teaching us that we need. We need not only to hear but to apply so that we may be ready when the King, our Lord, our Master Jesus comes back even for us. Thank you, Lord God, for this time. Thank you, Lord God, for the grace that continues to abound from your throne of mercy unto us, even as we receive your words with gladness, may you accomplish your will in our lives and through our lives for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray, amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is The Sheep and the Goats. Which one are you? We have been going through this chapter 25, and what we have here is the last of the three parables that Jesus gave here in Matthew chapter 25. The parables that tell us how to be ready when Jesus, our Lord, our King, comes back. Jesus, indeed, is coming back here on earth. He already came about 2,000 years ago, and history bears that record. He came as a Savior to save us from our sins. Born as a baby in a lowly manger. God became man. So that in His human form and body, He can show to us, relate to us, communicate to us the love of God. And demonstrated it actually through His death on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins, even the sin of the whole world. But praise God, He didn't remain dead. He resurrected on the third day. He ascended to heaven, but before He ascended, He said, even to His disciples and recorded in the Bible for us, 
his modern disciples, he will come back. But when he comes back, he returns as a judge and a king who will judge those who rejected him as Lord and Savior, those who did not repent of their sins, those who lived their lives just serving their own and their own interests and not the master's. And that's what we have here in this third and last parable of Jesus, teaching us how to be ready when he comes back. Jesus is fond of using parables to teach people. Remember, a parable is an earthly or true-to-life story that contains a lesson or a teaching that the Lord wants us to hear, but not only to hear, but to think about thoughtfully, to take in the lesson that He wants us to learn and apply in our lives. And so we already went through the first two parables, the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents. In the parable of the third ten virgins or bridesmaids, we learned that the first and most important thing is to make sure, to make sure that we are ready to meet the Lord, is to make sure that we have the Holy Spirit. And what this means is that we need to be born in the Spirit, a spiritual rebirth that Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 5 to 7, that we read and reading again. Jesus approached by a religious priest, a Pharisee whose name was Nicodemus, who knew that there was something missing. Even though he's he's knowledgeable of the Word of God, and he's been doing church things, active in the church, so to speak, yet he came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. And the spiritual rebirth happens when a person believes in their heart that Jesus is Lord. In other words, puts their faith in Him. When a person trusts completely, puts their faith in Christ alone, who is the only Savior, So we can say in a nutshell, to be sure that we are ready to meet the Lord, we must have faith. Possess that faith. True saving faith. Because not all faith is true, and not all faith or belief saves. As a matter of fact, for others, faith is just an intellectual exercise of agreeing facts and truth about God. Just like what the demons have. Remember, we've read it so many times in James chapter 2, verse 19, where it says, You believe that there is one God? Well, you do well. But listen, even the demons believe. That is to say, they intellectually exercise the facts and the truth of who God is. And they tremble about it. It's It's amazing. The demons and the devil, they are afraid of God and they are afraid of hell. And yet we meet people, as a matter of fact, half of the population perhaps, who are not afraid of hell, not even afraid of God. I've met people even in my high school batchmates and they would say, you know, I'm not afraid of hell. I'm going there and I will have party with my friends. Such a foolish statement. And so we need to have faith, genuine faith, true saving faith. True saving faith, as we have learned, is when you and I believe in our hearts, Jesus is Lord. When we acknowledge Jesus is Lord, so therefore we surrender the control of our lives, which is our hearts. We surrender it to Jesus who is Lord and submit to His control, meaning His Lordship. And that is why the evidence, the demonstration of true saving faith is a life of obedience. Faithful obedience to God's word. We're not talking about perfection, but a consistent life of obedience to God's word. In other words, faithful. And that's what faithfulness reflects. It reflects a constant, 
a consistent obedience to the Lord, to His Word that is seen in His work that He has given us. And that's what we've learned in the second parable, the parable of the talents. So there's saving faith. If you want to be ready, you need to have faith. What kind of faith? Saving faith. Then there's what? Faithful or obedient faith. So that's what we've learned. Have faith, be faithful, faithful to God's word that is seen in faithfulness to his work, his service, the ministry. As a matter of fact, that's what we have in this third and last parable. It begins in verse 31 that we have read, where Jesus uses his favorite title, the Son of Man. It says there, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Son of Man is a title for the Messiah, for the, Messiah the Christ, the anointed of God. The one who is chosen to come to save people from their sins. That's who Jesus is. The Savior, the Son of Man. And I believe that's why the Lord is fond of referring to Himself as the Son of Man. Because that title tells of His love. The Son of God who humbled Himself by becoming a man. Son of Man. So that He can serve. He can serve who? Humanity. Meeting humanity's greatest need, which is salvation. The Son of God, Christ Jesus, came as a servant to serve and not to be served. He came as a Savior to seek and to save the lost. As He Himself said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's you and I. That's everyone. Because we are all lost in sin, but thank God the Good Shepherd came and sought us who were lost. And now we are found by His grace. And so that's what Jesus did the first time He came down to earth. But the second time when he comes back, he will come in all his glory as the glorious son of God with all the angels with him. And he will sit on his glorious throne as judge and king who will preside over all. And so we read back to our text in verses 32 to 33. What will happen is all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now again, as I mentioned, when we went through the first parable, the parable of the ten virgins, the setting or context of all these parables and these events, as a matter of fact, has direct application to the people, particularly the people of Israel, as a nation who will be living in the days of tribulation before Jesus returns. But the application of the lesson of, for preparation is applicable to us who are living now before the coming great tribulation. So what we have here, a division of two groups of people described as sheep and goats. And that is certainly true to even, even today. Listen, as far as the Bible is concerned, there's really just two groups of people, especially coming from these parables. The description of people that divides people is clear. The wise, the foolish. That is, those who have faith, those who don't. The faithful and the unfaithful. Those who are obedient. And those who are not, the sheep and the goats, those who serve Jesus, and those who don't. Which one are you? There is a clear distinction. But what determines one to be a sheep 
and the other goat? What, what determines one to be a sheep and the other goat? In a one-word nutshell statement, service to Jesus. Service to Jesus. How? By serving His family. This is what we read in verse 34 to 36. Look at it. Then the king will say to those on his right, right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Isn't that a wonderful statement? Then even before we were born, the Lord has already thought of you and thought of us, his children, and prepared a kingdom for us. And then he says, verse 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Now, before anything else, this does not mean that service or doing acts of mercy in helping others results to salvation. No, we've already established the fact and the truth of the Word of God that works do not save. It is important to remember that this is the third parable, the parable that amplifies the point or lesson from the first parable that teaches us to be ready to meet the Lord that we must have what? Saving faith. First and foremost, without saving faith, it does not matter what you and I do. Without saving faith, we are lost, unforgiven, not saved. Good works, no matter how good, does not save, cannot save from sin. Faith alone, in Christ alone, saves us from sin. But as we have learned also, saving faith is not dormant. It's not passive. It is active. True faith is seen. It is demonstrated in acts of obedience to God's word. And obedience to God's word results to works. So true saving faith produces good works as a result of faithful obedience to God's word. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 26, if you remember, I guess I have not put it there. In James chapter 2, verse 26, it says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. In other words, it's useless. It does not save. Saving faith works, even the works of faithful service in the ministry. So this is what we have in the parable. Our text this morning affirms for us. And that's why faithful work of service to, to Jesus identified the sheep and not the goats. Because faithful works of service to Jesus is produced by faithful obedience to God's word, which is the demonstration of true saving faith. Now, I keep emphasizing faithful service to Jesus because we need to take note, it's not just serving and doing good to any people in need. This is not just any work or acts of mercy, of feeding hungry, feeding the hungry, and giving water to the thirsty showing hospitality to strangers, those who are not related to you, or giving clothes to those who don't have clothes, caring for the sick, or visiting those who are imprisoned, who are alone and lonely. Because in reality, even non-Christians can do these things. Even non-Christians can do philanthropic works. As a matter of fact, there are groups of people, organizations who are not believers in Christ, Yet they do the works of ministry or service to the needy. So the works of service mentioned in verses 35, 36, 
that we have read is specifically done to Jesus. Look at it again, if I can reverse this. There it is, verse 35 to 36. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me in. I was sick and you, cl- and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Jesus said, I, me. How is this possible? Is the poor that we see begging for money, Jesus? Is the homeless out there in the street, Jesus? That's a good question. And that's exactly what the sheep also asked the Lord that we read from verse 37 to 39. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison to go and visit me? You see that question? The, the, the righteous, the sheep, they were, they were confused and, and surprised as a matter of fact. How, how did we do this? When did we do this? And so in this question, the sheep asked wondering as to when and how they did these works of service to Jesus. Well, first, it shows us an important characteristic of the sheep. This is very important, the characteristic of the sheep. What kind of people are the sheep? They are people who truly have been changed in their hearts. People whose lives have been so transformed by the gospel of Christ that they serve. They unselfconsciously serve the body of Christ, which is the brothers and sisters in the Lord, the church family. This is one of the major lessons in this parable. The lesson of gospel transformation. The Lord is teaching us what it looks like to be changed by His grace. The sheep are the people who have experienced a transformation, a changing in their hearts. They are a new creation because of genuine faith in Christ. They are people who have truly experienced the amazing grace and the redeeming love of God in Christ Jesus, who paid for their sins, forgave all their sins, and gave them eternal life, so that they are grateful to the Lord, forever grateful to Him. And in response, they have given their lives, devoted their lives to serving Him. Does this reflect you? Does this reflect us? It should. Because the Lord is our shepherd and we are his sheep. And of all people, we were once lost, but God found us. And we understand that once we were hungry, but God gave us the bread of life. And we were thirsty and God gave us water of life. We were strangers and God invited us in. We were naked and God clothed us with his righteousness. We were sick and the Lord healed us. We were imprisoned, and the Lord visited us and set us free. And that's why we love. That's why we serve our master, Jesus. Because the Lord poured His grace upon us. And when we receive God's grace, His goodness that we do not deserve, His grace changes us. His grace changes our hearts. It it rewires the motivational structure of our hearts so that we serve. We do things simply because we love Jesus. We love Him because He first loved us. And His love fills us and overflows through us so that our love for Him is seen. It is seen in how we serve others and care for others in ways that are simple 
ordinary so that we do good, we help without even thinking about it. We don't do it to earn His goodness. We don't, serve, we don't serve to get something in return, to get a recognition, to get a reward. We give love, kindness, service. We help and, doing, and do good to others, particularly to the brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are in need amongst us. It's just a natural outflow of our lives. Of all people, we should be serving and helping. Because we all have received God's mercy and God's grace. He helped us. He loved us. He saved us. And He calls us to help those who are in need. He calls us to serve Him. How? By serving specifically, particularly, brothers and sisters in Christ. Because it is with the brethren that Jesus identifies with. When we serve the brethren, we are serving Jesus. We serve Jesus by serving the brothers and sisters in Christ, by serving the church, serving the body of Christ, which is his family. Look at verse 40. Jesus responds. He tells them, the king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these who? Brothers and sisters of who? Mine, you did it to me. Is that what he said? Whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. That's who the Lord identifies with. And who are his brothers and sisters? Well, the Lord, I mean, this verse at least teaches us that Jesus identifies with His family, the spiritual family or God's forever family, which is the church. So the hungry, the thirsty, the poor and the lonely that is being re referred to in these verses are not the poor. They are not the poor. They're not the needy that we see out there in the streets or wherever we find or hear of needy people. Now, I'm not saying that we should not help them or give to them. There are enough verses in the Bible that instructs us to give to the poor and help the needy. But this parable of the sheep and the goats is not one of them. But that does not mean that we should not give to the poor and help the needy. We should. But understand that the top or most important help that we need to give them is the gospel message of the Lord. The material help that we give is just a way for us to have an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. If we just give material help but not give the gospel, we are missing the point. But more than anything else, God tells us to give the gospel message to people, to the lost. That is the service, the ministry that God wants us to do for the people out there. But the text that we have in this parable is not referring to them. It's referring to brothers and sisters in the Lord. Jesus identifies with His people. He calls them His brothers, His sister, His family. Even in the book of Matthew, we have this in context in Matthew chapter 12, if you remember. Yeah, Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 40. It says, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd because he went to his hometown, ministered to his people. And then in one place, in a house where he's ministering to his disciples, those believers and followers of him, it says there, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother 
and sister and mother. In other words, Jesus identifies with his spiritual family. Now understand that Jesus is not denying his earthly family. He's just emphasizing the fact and reality that his earthly family is temporary. Look at your family right now. That, our family here is temporary. But his spiritual family is eternal. It is his forever family. Therefore, his spiritual family is more significant than his earthly family. The church is God's family. The church is his family, his body. So that what you do with a brother or sister in Christ, how you treat a fellow believer in the Lord, you are doing it to Jesus. Isn't that what? Saul, who became the apostle Paul, discovered. Remember, Paul, the, the apostle, was once a Pharisee. And he went about persecuting Christians. He actually wanted to arrest as many as he can and put them in prison to persecute, if not torture them, if not put them to death. So that one day in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 5, it says there, Meanwhile, Saul, that was his name before he became Paul. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way. Who is the way? Jesus is the way. Christians at the time were not called Christians. They were called those who belonged to the way. It says there, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why, are you why do you persecute me? Notice that. And Saul said, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Jesus, through a voice, said, Soul, soul, not soul, soul, but soul, soul. Why are you persecuting the church? No, he didn't say that. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? Jesus identifies with his church, the brothers and sisters in Christ. The church is his family. Jesus said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. When you think about it, this makes our service to the church family very significant, very important, if not a priority. But wait, isn't my family my priority? God is our priority. I'll give you $100 to tell me in the scripture that family is our priority. The Bible teaches us that God is our priority. The Lord Jesus, He is our priority. And since the Lord identifies with His church, so much so that whatever we do to our brother or sister in Christ, we do it to the Lord, that shows to us that the priority of serving the brethren. This shows us the significance and importance of what we do with and how we treat the brethren in Christ is very significant to the Lord. What you and I do with the brothers and sisters in Christ, we do it to the Lord. We do it to Jesus. I know we have been told that our earthly family is our priority. And I understand that. I have my own earthly family. And I am by no means saying that our families are not important or significant. Of course they are. 
But we need to understand that making our family or my family a priority simply means this, that I do not neglect my responsibilities to my family. So that what I do in serving others, what I do to the church family, I better make sure that I do it first to my family because it will be hypocritical for me to serve others and not serve my family. As a matter of fact, it will be an act of disobedience, a sin, if I take care of others but neglect my own family. But taking care of my family does not mean that I can neglect God's family just because my family is my priority. No. Jesus is my priority. Jesus is our priority. And Jesus says to us, serve your family. No, he says what? Serve one another. Love one another. Understanding that Jesus identifies with his family. And we make the mistake when we think that our family takes precedence over God's family. At best, we need to balance it. So we better make sure that we don't neglect or ignore or not care about God's family, which is the church. In Tagalog's lingo, you know, it's just serve the Lord. Wala na marami pa, etching, etching pa. We better make sure that we don't neglect or ignore and not even care about God's family, which is the church. Because that kind of attitude is what made the goats both rejected and judged by the Lord. Look at verse 41 to 43. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into eternal fire and prepared for the devil and his angels. Before I, before I proceed, you know that the, God prepared the kingdom of God for us, but he prepared hell. Is that what he said? The eternal fire, which is hell, he prepared it for who? The devil and his angels. It's not prepared for people. God didn't make hell for people. He made it for the devil and his angels. However, people who reject God will not be in heaven because they don't want God. But since there's no other place that God created, there's just heaven and earth and uh, hell, then people who rejected God will have to go to eternal hell. That's what he said here. Depart from me into the eternal fire that's prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me in. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Verse 44. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? In other words, what they're saying is, if they only knew it was Jesus, then they would have made it a priority to serve. Serve who? Serve the brethren. But the goats have other priorities, you see, so that they are selective. Selective in who they will serve. Selective in the use of their time. Selective, not in a good way, but selective in a selfish way. Because if they had known the needy was Jesus amongst the brethren, they would have rushed to serve him. But that's the point. The ghosts only serve they only serve if the people they are serving is significant to them. The sheep, on the other hand, are people, again, who truly have been changed in their hearts. People whose lives have been so transformed by the gospel of Christ, by the love of Jesus, so that they serve regardless who they are serving. So they are not selective in their service. They, again, they unselfconsciously serve the body of Christ, which is the brothers and sisters in the Lord or the church family. 
To them, it doesn't matter who the brother or sister is. If they are in need, they serve. They do what they can to help meet the need. No excuses. They make a way. They do not neglect the work. They do not neglect the service. Unlike the ghosts, they are selective in their service so that if someone who needs help is significant to them or close to them, someone they like, there's a good chance that they will give their time, their service, they will give their resources. But if it's someone insignificant to them, they could care less. Again, in Tagalog's, Tagalog's lingua, lingo, bayama na. Di naman natin kaano-ano eh. They have many excuses not to serve or not to help. They're busy. They're tired. Place is too far. I had surgery. My family is my priority. So they don't serve the brethren. They let others do the work. They neglect the family of God. They neglect the, the Lord. So what does Jesus tell the goats? Look at verse 45. He will, he will truly reply, he will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. And the judgment for the goats, we already read, but Jesus says it again in verse 46, They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The righteous are the people who consistently have been doing what is right. Right in the eyes of God. Right according to what the word says. But the goats, they will go away to what kind of punishment? Eternal. Eternal punishment. That is sad, is it not? As a matter of fact, it's a tragedy. Because the goats thought, they were sheep. But that's what the Lord, through this parable, warns people even today. People who go to church, who think they are Christians or children of God, but they are not. They think they are Christians because they go to church like the sheep, and they sing songs of praise to God like the sheep. I mean, did you know that the sheep and the goats sound the same? <laughs> And if you, I mean, I mean, you're not looking, you're just doing your own business and you hear, eh, 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 you think it's, it's a goat or it's a sheep. But they both sound the same. The difference, the sheep follow the shepherd. That's the difference. The sheep follow the shepherd. There are people who are in the church who follow church activities but are not following Jesus. I'm not saying that activities are bad, but if they think that Christianity is just doing activities, that's not it. They come to church and they are good on a Sunday morning for two hours. After church, going out in the parking lot and someone annoys them, words come out. Fingers begin to salute. They are good during the Sunday morning worship service, but after that and throughout the rest of the week, they are not following Jesus in His Word. They don't even spend time with Jesus in prayer and His Word. Oh, they have a list of do's and don'ts, but they are not really following the Word of the Lord. Therefore, they are not really serving Jesus. And if ever they serve, they are selective, as we've said, in their service. They serve according to their terms, their time, and they will serve when they say so, not when the Lord says so. And worse, they will serve if they will get something in return. If not, no thanks. They are just using Christianity and using Christ for personal gain, for health and for wealth, to live the best life now. They are like this because they do not have a relationship with Jesus because they have never been born again. So that Jesus, so, so Jesus is not their priority. They are, they are not faithful to His word. 
so that they are not faithful to His work, doing His will, even the will of the Father. And so like the goats, they will be surprised when they see Jesus and the Lord rejects them and even judges them. Remember Matthew 7, that Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I mean, Lord, didn't we do all these activities and all these ministries? Uh, Why weren't we active? Verse 23, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. It doesn't mean that he doesn't know their name. But I don't know you on a personal level because you don't have a personal relationship with me. Another way of saying is you don't have eternal life because eternal life is knowing the Lord. And so away away from me, you evildoers. You're just doing these things because you think you can earn your way to heaven. You think that this will add to your list of good works that you can present to Jesus. Look, Jesus, I attended faithfully. But the question is, did you serve him faithfully? And that is an outflow when we truly believe and trust the word of God. So in closing, back to the parable of the sheep and the goats, which one are you? Don't answer out loud but seriously evaluate your faith with this test questions. Do you have true saving faith? Is your faith seen in faithful acts of obedience to God's word? Are you actively and faithfully serving Jesus by serving the family of God with His church? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So, did you pass the test? If not, then humbly come before the Lord and acknowledge your sin, your sinfulness, and your need of Jesus as your Savior. Make a decision to believe in Jesus Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Do that now while there is still time because remember, tomorrow or even later is not guaranteed. God loves you and He gave His only begotten Son to pay for your sin by dying on the cross of Calvary. Jesus shed His blood and died on your behalf so that you may be forgiven and cleansed of all your sins, but you need to surrender to Him. And acknowledge Him in your heart as your Lord. Make that decision to follow Jesus by giving the control of your life to Him. For He is Lord. Will you do that? Will you believe in Jesus? Will you come and follow Him as your master? If you never made that decision ever, I plead with you to decide that today. If that is your your decision, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. But I just like to ask if you've never made the decision, and all for you, this Christian thing and church thing is just an emotional experience, but you've never really made the decision, but you want to make the decision now, raise your hand so that I can pray for you. Anyone? Perhaps you're watching through live stream. If you've made the decision, it would be a joy for me to know. So you can text me, call me, or anyone that you know here so that we can also pray for you. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message you've given us today. Completing the three parables in this chapter of Matthew 25. Teaching us how to be ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back. And truly, Lord God, may we evaluate 
our own faith, our own relationship with you, to test truly whether we are in Christ or not. And if we are, we are forever grateful to you because it is only truly by your grace. Jesus, it is you who have made it possible. And that's why we present and offer ourselves to you once again, even today. We belong to you. We are your servants. Use us indeed for the glory and honor of your name. And for those who have not made the decision, I pray that you will speak to them. Have mercy upon them. And I pray that they will humble themselves and acknowledge you in their hearts, in their lives as their Lord and Savior. And pray that they will do that before you come back. We ask this for the glory and honor of your name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about